Hello, and welcome to your lecture on k-means. So this lecture is very exciting because it is our first unsupervised machine learning algorithm. So far, all the algorithms that we've learned have been supervised. What this means is that there is a correct answer and the goal of our model is to predict it. For instance, in all of our classification models, we have a correct answer which category the data belongs to. And the goal of our models is to try and predict that category accurately. Supervised machine learning works with what we call labeled data. This basically means that it does have those correct answers that we're trying to guess. So if that's what supervised machine learning is, you might guess that unsupervised machine learning occurs when we don't have a correct answer. But you might be thinking, well, then what is the point of unsupervised machine learning if there's no correct answer that we can then predict? The overarching goal of unsupervised machine learning is to find latent structure in our data. The best example, and honestly, one of the most common things that we do with unsupervised machine learning is clustering. In clustering, the way we find this latent structure in the data is by taking that data and creating groups that didn't exist before. However, this isn't the only way to do unsupervised machine learning, which you'll learn as we get to things like principal component analysis. Like I mentioned before, the entire point of clustering is to take data points and create new categories or groups that didn't exist before. Again, we're not trying to create clusters that are all one category of another variable we have in our model. Rather, we're trying to create new groups. So for instance, we might use this for something called market segmentation. We might want to take all of our customers and segment them into different groups of similar customers. We can then use those groups to do useful things like serve targeted ads, give coupons, or overall change the user experience of the customer with our product. The first clustering algorithm that we're going to talk about is called k-means. k is just a variable that indicates how many groups or clusters that we'd like to find. One thing I sometimes like to do is show you some math notation for the algorithms we're learning to show you that sometimes seemingly complicated math notation is actually talking about something very simple. So let's talk about the ideas behind k-means. K-means is a clustering algorithm, which means we're going to take all of our data points and we're going to assign them to clusters. In k-means, every single data point is in a cluster. What it's saying is that if you take the data points in each individual cluster, C1, C2, etc., and combine them, you get the entire data set. In other words, every data point belongs to a cluster. In k-means, data points only belong to one cluster, and that's what this line of math notation means. It says that the intersection between two clusters is the empty set. In other words, there are no data points that are in both cluster A and cluster B. Last but not least, the entire goal of k-means is to create groups that are cohesive. This means that within a group, data points are similar. Hopefully that makes sense. If we're doing clustering for something like market segmentation, we want to make sure that the groups of customers we create are very similar to each other so that whatever we do is applicable to all of those customers. That's what these lines of math mean. This is basically saying that when we create our groups, we are choosing those groups in a way that minimize the within in cluster variance. This function w just represents that within function variance and is calculated like this. Basically, it's the average squared distance of each data point to every single other data point within that cluster. And this formula is actually missing this little notation, which just means that we're dividing by the number of data points in that cluster. So as you see, this complicated math is describing some pretty non-complicated ideas. In k-means, every single data point is in a cluster and it's only in one cluster. A data point can't belong to multiple clusters. Our goal when we choose these groups or clusters is to minimize the within cluster variance. In other words, we want data points within a cluster to be as similar to each other as possible. So how do we do that? Well, let's look at an overview of the k-means algorithm. There's three main steps in the k-means algorithm. The first one is something we only have to do once. 
which is randomly initialize our clusters. What this typically looks like is we'll select K random data points from our data set and we'll treat those as the center of our K clusters. Then we're going to take these two steps right here and as you can see in step four we're just going to repeat them over and over. I think these are better explained visually so let's look at a graph. So we're on step one. As we discussed step one is just randomly initializing our clusters. One way to do that is just to randomly select k different data points from our data set and we're just going to say okay as a starting point these are going to act as the center of our clusters. Now through the process of the k-means algorithm we're going to improve these clusters. This is just a starting point. Now remember we only have to do this once and on this graph you can see that we've done it. We've taken three because in this case k is going to equal three random data points and we have set them as the center of our clusters indicated by these little plus marks. Now our goal is going to be to improve these clusters. Randomly selected data points are probably not going to be the greatest center of our clusters, so let's improve them a little bit. In order to improve them, we first start with step two. In step two, we look at those cluster centers and we assign every single data point in our data set to whichever center it is closest to. Here you can see that the data points are now colored, indicating which of the centers these data points are the closest to. And that's step two. But we're not going to stop there. Now that we have data points assigned to a cluster, we are going to update where the center of those clusters are. Because now that we have actual members of that cluster, we can probably come up with a better center. The way we do that is by taking the mean for each cluster of all of our predictor variables. In this case, you may have noticed that we're clustering on the average number of pizzas that someone eats per week and the average number of toppings. For the red group, you can see that we've moved the cluster center to be at the average number of pizzas per week for that cluster and the average number of toppings per week for that cluster. And now that we have new cluster centers, we probably want to reassign our data points because now some of them are much closer to other centers than they are to their own center. So we go back to step two and we reassign all of our data points to the closest cluster center. And then, you guessed it, we reassign our centers by taking the mean of each cluster. We then repeat this over and over until something called convergence. Convergence essentially means that we have a stable set of clusters. We can think of this in two different ways. First, Stable clusters mean that data points don't switch clusters when we're iterating through steps two and three over and over again. So if as we do steps two and three, data points aren't actually changing clusters, we can consider our model to be converged. On the other hand, we can also think of convergence as stability of the centers of the clusters. As we repeat steps two and three over and over, if the centers only change a little or not at all, we can also consider that convergence. As you can tell, these are are basically two ways of looking at the exact same thing. We have clusters that are stable. They're not changing as we iterate through steps two and three over and over. Now, when we're doing k-means, it's really important to think about the assumptions that the algorithm is making about the clusters that we create. The first and most important assumption is about the shape of the clusters. K-means assumes spherical variance and therefore basically assumes that our clusters are roughly spherical. Now, this basically means that you could take a sphere or a circle in two dimensions and encompass the entire cluster. It doesn't mean that the cluster itself has to be perfectly spherical. The other assumption that k-means makes is that there's roughly the same number of data points in each cluster. It doesn't have to be an exact, but we don't expect there to be a cluster with like two points and another with a million. So now that we know how to run k-means, how do we decide if the model is doing well? In supervised machine learning, we've had the privilege of knowing what the correct answer that our model should spit out is, and we can just compare the output of the model to what we know the answer should be. But in unsupervised machine learning, by definition, we don't have a correct answer. So how do we decide whether the model is doing well or not? Well, one way we can do that is we can look at how cohesive and separate the clusters are. Cohesion refers to the idea that data points within a cluster are very similar to other data points in that cluster. Remember we talked about this before. When we create clusters, we want to make sure that we're creating groups of data points or people that are as similar to each other as possible. And that's exactly what cohesion represents. On the other hand, separation measures how different different clusters are from each other. 
each other. If we have good, well-defined groups, then hopefully different groups are very different from each other. If we have well-defined clusters, then we hope that they have high cohesion and high separation. One way to measure both cohesion and separation in our clusters is with something called a silhouette score. The silhouette score compares two things. The first is this A term. This basically represents the average distance between data points and other members of its own cluster. So for each data point, we look at the distance between it and all the members of its own cluster, take the average, and that's what this term is. We also might want to know how separate clusters are. One way that we can measure that is the average distance between a data point and the members of the next closest cluster. If our clusters are really separate, our data point should be pretty far away from members of another cluster. That's represented by this B term. We then divide by this maximum of AI or BI just so that our silhouette score is scaled between negative 1 and 1. As you can see, our silhouette score will be high when both cohesion and separation are high. If we have clusters that are very separate, then a data point should be very far away from the members of a different cluster, so this BI will be quite large. On the other hand, if we have very cohesive clusters, then the distance between a data point and all of its neighbors in its same cluster should be very small. Thus, we're taking a very large number, bi, and subtracting a very small number, ai, so we'll get a very large silhouette score. As you can see, we can calculate a silhouette score for every single data point in our data set. Then, if we take the average of them, it gives us an idea of how well our clusters are performing across the entire data set. As you can see, when our data point is just about as close to data points in the next closest cluster as it is to data points in its own cluster, cluster, we'll get a silhouette score near zero. This means that a negative silhouette score actually means that a data point is closer to data points in another cluster than to its own cluster. While negative silhouette scores are pretty common for individual data points, it's rare to see an average silhouette score for an entire data set that's negative. One last thing that's important to remember is that silhouette scores specifically measure cohesion and separation. Later on the line, we might learn some algorithms that make clusters but don't necessarily value those things. So silhouette scores are mainly reliable ways of assessing clusters that do prioritize cohesion and separation. And k-means has been used to do a lot of cool things. For instance, here it was used to do image segmentation. In this case, that refers to taking the pixels and clustering them so that you can tell which parts of a leaf in an image are healthy versus diseased. It's also been used in conjunction with k and n to do things like movie recommendation. So as you can see, for a very simple clustering algorithm, k-means has a lot of different applications. All right, that's all I have for you. I will see you next time.